All right. Thanks very much, and uh, thanks, Patrick, for the talk. I didn't, never knew anything about Elm, so I might try it out. Looks pretty cool, especially for some uh, functional uh, craziness that's going on these days. Um, all right, so um, it's going to be an entirely different topic. <laughs> um, so um, as you said, I'm going to talk uh, mostly about microservices and some of the problems that we can have um, when trying to test them, and especially in, in the integration um, side of things. So um, my name is Pierre Vincent. Um, I'm a tech team lead uh, at Newsweaver. Uh, I've been working there for a long time now, about eight, nine years, um, and I've seen a lot of things happening. Um, so just for those who don't know, Newsweaver is a company based in Cork. We, uh, we're building software as a service uh, for um, internal communications. So it's a big platform for helping uh, large company to communicate better, improve and unify their communications, report on them, uh, and basically measuring that their employees are engaged um, and across all different types of channels, so intranet, email, um, video, social networks, um, all these kind of things. So, um, so at Newsweaver, for a long time, I've, I've worked on a large um, kind of monolithic application, so large J2E, uh, multi-layered, so multi-tiered, hibernate, spring, and everything that comes with it. Uh, and that app is still going great. Um, it's making for probably 99% of the money that the business is making. So um, monoliths are not necessarily evil in, 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 their, own, in their own way. But, um, but two years ago, I moved to a new team, and we were building a new product pretty much from scratch. We got the opportunity to um, maybe investigate new things, try on new things, and our big focus was on continuous delivery, so being able to just send things to production faster, get feedback faster, um, and microservices actually emerged in our research as an architecture of choice for, for what we wanted to, to achieve there. And from these days now, we're building everything of our new code in this, and we're splitting off our monolith into, um, into separate smaller services. So what does it mean, starting from this piece, so that would be what I mentioned by a monolith. And if you're lucky, you have these little dots inside that you know that there's multiple different parts. If you're not lucky, there might just be a big block and a big database under it. But the idea is that if you want to move to microservices, you kind of have to have an idea of what's sort of different contexts, what's sort of the different pieces that you're going to be working with. And the idea is to evolve to some something like this, rather than having one big database. Um, now we have. Separate, um, separate services with their own database, managing their own data. The boundaries are clearer, so we actually know now we have all these things that are separate. One thing that's not represented in this picture is actually all the interactions that happens uh, between those services or between those components that you would have. Inside the, the left-hand side now in, in, the mic, in, the, in the monolith, these interactions are very implicit. We don't really think about them on the everyday basis. Like, Potentially, these might be different jars, maybe different packages. You might see, like, these interactions are method, method calls. They're based on interfaces. It might be, like, the name of a function. It might be objects that are returned with fields. So we don't really think about them because if we say, if we change the method name, the compiler is going to give out, and we're going to fix it straight away. If we change the class signature or change the class fields, the compiler is going to catch that for us. And most of the time, we don't actually make these mistakes because we use IDE refactoring, all these sorts of things. Now, when we move to microservices, the problem is these interactions are becoming the core concern. And potentially, since we're going to have that, most, um, that, that looser coupling between the services, we're going to be saying talking about HTTP with REST. Uh, that means there's REST endpoints, there's JSON. Um, it's a lot easier to break. Um, especially if we're not careful about them. So obviously, we kind of need to test them. So what, what does that look like, that kind of interaction? So let's take a very kind of simple example of um, if we have two teams working on two different services, one, one would be a login service, so essentially the login form. You type in your login, your password, and, and you're in. And another team uh, might be responsible for the user service, and, and that, that um, service has a database of users, um, with all sorts of information that the user services are runs responsible for. Typically, login service might need to get a user. So it's going to communicate with the user service through a REST API and issue a GET request for slash user slash Pierre. And the user service is going to respond saying, yeah, I have a user called Pierre. That's a 200 response. And here is the username, the name, and 
like a role that might be useful for saying, okay, this is the privileges you kind of need for that user when you lock that user in. So now all these things, if we look back at the monolith, this might just be uh, an interface call saying, get the user and it returns a user class that might be a Java bean or standard like plain Java object that has a user field, name field, and role field that are just strings. If we change any of that, the compiler gives out. Now that we've decoupled these, this interaction, how do we test any of this? So how do we test that this endpoint actually exists, that doesn't change? How do we test that the response code is actually the one we expect? And how do we expect, uh, how do we test that? Well, this payload there is what we wanted. So why do we want to test this? Because what if the user's team says, actually, we've got a requirement now, and the user doesn't have one role now, we can have multiple roles. So off we go, now we're going to change the users, and now um, the role uh, field is now becoming roles with an S, and now it's an array. So when we're looking at this bit, it's kind of obvious, OK, we're probably going to break things, because now we've changed it. It can be a lot more subtle than this, because we generally don't write JSON directly. Um, it usually is a class that we return from our resource in our API, and Jackson is serializing it for us. And typically there, the user's class that's going to be serialized is just going to be refactored. The unit tests are going to be refactored. Everything is going to be looking all, all good and great for, for, the, uh, for the user service. But we can kind of predict that that might have uh, kind of negative consequences. So let's have a look at it from the point of two teams working on this. So we have our user service that's running in production, so no problem. We have not made any changes. Uh, monitoring is all green, no logs, no errors. And the login service is running in production, and it's running forever. Like this, this thing has been built for like months and months. It's rolling away. Nobody's really worrying about it. Nobody's changing that. And obviously, it still works fine. The user's team goes and implement that change. Um, they're going away coding on their own machine. Nothing changed in production, so obviously everything is great. Is, is great. The user's team have committed their change. It goes and runs on the build. No problem. They refactor the test. Now their tests expect that there's going to be multiple roles, so they've, everything is fine. Login service, still happily running away, unaware that something is actually kind of creeping up. Um, you can probably guess where I'm going at with this. Um, so now we're deploying this in production. So user service, they're happy. Um, and then deploy, and look, everything is actually still fine at this point. Um, there is not many more errors, because they're getting requests. They're responding with 200. Um, there's not really any errors showing up. Their service is up. Um, but boom, now people can't log in anymore. And now it might be a team somewhere else in the world. It might be a team alongside it. Um, and if, if you're lucky, you actually notice that yourself because you have some monitoring. If you're not, then maybe people will start ringing. Um, and the problem there is that it's a change from this side that affected a change in the other team. Um, this team might actually, actually spend a while investigating why this is going wrong. They're going to go back to your service and say, you changed everything in your API, and you've broken. Um, you actually broken the login. So well, maybe you should have tested something uh, before deploying straight into production. Um, so obviously, that graph is kind of highlighting the fact that it's pushing directly to production. But um, if we had pushed into a test environment or a UAT environment, we would have still broken the UAT environment for something pretty basic that we could have caught earlier. But the question is, what are we really testing? Um, are we testing that people can log in? Um, are we actually testing that we broke an interaction. It's actually a very small piece of change that we've made there that we should have tested. And at what stage should we actually test that as well? Because testing is there to stop us from doing something stupid. It's, it's there to protect us whenever we change something. It's, it's not necessarily like you can use test and TDD to help you de develop. But the tests that are inside your system is like you want to be there to say, when I run this test, it's because I want to know if a singular thing fails. Because if that test fails, I don't want to have to go and dig up why it, why it actually failed. So OK, let's go. Now the logins team, there's been a big, big post-mortem after the whole, the, whole, the whole thing. And they say, no, the users team, look, guys, whenever you make a change, you have to check if you can log in. Because like, no, we don't trust you anymore. So your team takes it on and say, OK, look, we want to test that interaction is, is working fine. So we're going to, we have our user service and our login service. So we're going to start both services in our build environment and, and verify that things work. 
So we have to provision a small database in there with some users that we can test with because we want to try and log in. And then we want to try and test if the login works, but the login service in, on its own is kind of annoying to test because it's a lot of redirects and there's a lot of SAML and all like single sign-on kind of thing. Um, so we decided actually we're going to start the front end for this because it's going to be easier. It's going to be user input. We're going to use like Selenium and input the logins and see if that works. So there we go. We have started a little bit more than we wanted, but now we can write a nice, uh, nice unit test or nice integration test for this. Unfortunately, the login service also needs to check IPs because we have some things for verifying um, well, that people come from really where they're supposed to be coming. Um, and now we need to provision a few IPs in there. So, well, okay, we're just going to add that. Okay, local host is actually allowed to come uh, when we're testing that. So let's go. Let's run our tests. And ah, our tests still fail because oh, now we generate tokens for the authentication. So um, if we want to generate a token, we need to link up with a token generation service that also needs something with certs and keys. So now we're going to need to generate certs and sign certs. And so, and this is becoming just a really sad story now because all we wanted to test was this bit. Um, and there's so many wrong things about this picture, right? Is the user service is actually writing that entire test. They don't care about any of the rest of it there. Like they might care a bit about this. No way they care about relationships that are more than one link with them. Um, and let's say, let's imagine this service now starts to have another dependency. Then say it, it just starts behaving differently. Now our integration test is actually breaking. And all of this might take a long, long time to start up. Now we need to start five services, but we can see like in a real kind of real life cases, we might start dragging half our system um, to do, doing that kind of stuff. So it's going to take resources. It's going to take time. It's going to be brittle. And look, most of the time, it might actually, 99% of the time, it might actually be fine. It might actually pass because we haven't broken anything. And now all we've done is create uncertainty inside our pipeline that now we can't deploy anything fast because every time we're going to have to run this, that might take 20 minutes to run and it's going to fail 50% of the time. So we're just going to click rerun. Oh, that's fine. No, I've wasted two hours because it just kind of keeps rolling on uh, that way. So can we test this earlier? And can we actually just test the, this bit um, without actually having to worry about all that? So this is where consumer driven contracts come in. So we have our two services with our two teams there. And rather than argue over who's testing what, um, it's bringing back the focus to that interaction that is between those two services. So they're going to come together and come up with a contract saying, well, this is, um, this is that interaction that we all rely on. So the, this contract will specify what kind of API end, endpoints there are, what kind of responses they're going to get. And this is not just an API documentation. It's not an API spec that we write once and then we just put in the confluence or something and then that starts drifting away. This is a contract that is, has to be continuously tested. So the consumers will have to ensure that whatever they ask for um, is using, is actually just going for what is specified. And the provider, so that's the consumer side, and the provider side needs to verify that whatever they're producing is still according to what the contract says. Um, so that's the base concept. Um, thankfully, there are some frameworks to help us doing that. So what we're using um, at Newsweaver's framework called Pact, which has emerged quite, um, quite a lot in the last couple of years as one of the big ways to, to do uh, contract testing. So, I'm, and I'm going to talk mostly about that. Some people use their own frameworks. They roll their own thing. That's perfectly fine. Um, but Pact is opinionated, but we actually quite agree with the way it's going. Um, and um, it's worked great for us. So there's really no need to, to reinvent the wheel um, in, that, um, in that situation. When I'm going to be talking after that uh, about Pact, I'm going to be mentioning, let's say, a Pact. A Pact is a contract, so that's inter interchangeable. A Pact or a Pact file is, a, is another term for, for a contract. Um, so what is Pact? So Pact is not actually a framework that, actually, that you can download straight away. It's, it's, uh, most, mostly it's a specification that says this is what a, an interaction looks like. This is what um, you should define as a, as a contract between services. And it's very centered around tolerant reader or Postel's law, which is essentially some things that help you to 
evolve API without being too hindered on versioning. So tolerant reader just means that you should be tolerant about what you're receiving back from an API or from any, anything that you consume. What it means is for our user service login service is like if the user service was suddenly now replying with, I don't know, um, an email address field on top of the three existing one, it shouldn't break the consumer. The consumer should say, well, you send me more that I want. Um, look, that's fine. I'm just going to ignore it. Um, so all the verification philosophy behind the pact says that if you're sending more than you should be, then that's fine. It, that matches for headers, for content, for everything. And it comes with a lot of implementation guidelines that now brings us the important stuff is now there's a lot of implementation of that spec. So um, if you have um, like us, like services in Java or in Node or in Go, that's, that's fucking great. It, it uh, originated in Ruby. So most of the stuff um, at the start was in Ruby, but now there's a lot of stuff like um, it's even in Swift, in .NET, uh, so you can have an iOS app that consumes an API that's uh, being served by a Ruby on Rails app. You can actually contract the two sides and they can actually verify each other. So that's, that's really powerful, that, um, especially for the microservices spirit that you should be able to write every different bit in the different technologies that suit the, the problem better. So, Let's take an example now so of our situation where now we actually want to test this um, with, with PAC. So now both parties are going to be responsible to verify the, that interaction, but it's going to happen in, in a bit of a two-step process. So the first thing we do when we want to, so the first thing is going to happen, so it's consumer-driven, so the consumer is going to generate the pact. So the first thing is we're going to start the PAC mock server, which is like essentially like any mock server that you would start in a unit test. Um, and we're going to actually write that consumer unit test as part of our, of our build. So it's, it is not something that we build afterwards. It's part of our unit test in our consumer base code. And we could see that as if you have a, like a service consumer as a unit test anywhere in your code. So like say your service consumes an API, you're very likely to write that exact same test. So start a mock and say, if I send you this request, then you should send me this response and then trigger the interaction and verify that it works. Like any test that you would actually have a unit test of a REST API, this is what it's going to look like. Except this time, when we trigger the interaction, the mock server will generate a packed file. It's going to record that information, record this, the fact that if I'm being called with this, this endpoint, with these parameters, with these headers, then I should be responding with that, that, um, that content. And on this side, it's going to verify that that content is properly handled by the, by the service, by the consuming service. Then when we have that pack that recorded a number of interactions, um, we're going to share it with the users team, which in its turn now, and it's in its own time, and as many times as they want, they're going to be able to verify that they're doing the right thing. So in their provider test, they're going to take the pack and they're going to replay anything that has been recorded. And the cool thing is, as I said, this can be run any time and any number of times. So any time this team makes a change, that's a unit test. They can just run, replay all the interactions that would have been generated before and verify very quickly there's an assumption that another service is made that we have broken. So two step, we play and we record the interaction and then we replay and we verify. What's very powerful is here, this is a unit test this is a unit test. We did not start the service anywhere. We did not start a test environment. We did not start any other dependencies. Still, we're able to verify that no, that API is not broken. The endpoint still works. The payload is still looking like something that the other side understands. So it might be a bit different, but it's, they still understand it. Um, and all this is going to prevent things from happening. And very fast feedback, we know that very early. The cool thing is, we know that in the developer machine now. It's even before any commit, we know straight away that something was, um, that something happened. So what, what's actually in the packed file? It, it's, it is very simple. Um, and unlike the Elm generated code, it's actually readable. <laughs> um, so the consumer is, so it, 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 it does contain the definition of what, what the interaction is between this, those two services that we, that, we, that, we are, that we're testing. So the consumer essentially here, that's our login service. The provider, uh, which is the user service, and then a set of interactions. It could be like different examples of how we use a, a single endpoint, or it could be a number of different endpoints. Um, 
And an interaction is going to start from an assumption, which is going to be called as, as well as a, a provider state. It's going to help the provider set up the test uh, before the interaction is replayed. Um, essentially, for our test there is say, given that a user called Pierre exists, then when I receive um, a request, that is a get request with so, like path slash users, etc., and with these headers, then my expected response should be of such status with this header and this body. This could include query parameters. If there was a post, it could include the post body and, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it does work for, for a lot. Um, it, it does work for a lot of the interactions that you would do um, inside, a, inside, a REST, um, inside a REST API. But if you remember, I, there was that part between the consumer and the producer in which we share the contract. So how do we share that contract? Um, I would say originally just pass it on, just email on the contract or copy it or put in a repo and refer to it by URLs. That works really well. When the number of teams starts growing, um, it's a little bit harder to maintain uh, because now you're going to have a number of interactions between the number of cross teams. Um, it's easier to lose track um, and it's easier to have a, a dated contract where you might not even know what's happening. Luckily, with Pact, there is a tool called Pact Broker um, that allows you to share contracts easily between teams. It works this way. Every team that, and every, every team that has services that have packs, they just can push their packs to the broker. Um, and then in their own term, the providers can just go and say, well, any contract that's actually aimed at me, just give it to me and I'll go and verify it. So there may be contracts from all the different, type, different teams, um, um, yeah, all, all different teams um, that then we can just verify. So that's just a file storage, right? But it's a little bit more. That's it's luckily because there's a few added bonuses into it. First of all, there's nice UI in it. So like when the packs are posted to the broker, we get dependency graphs, we get relationships. So it's a cool way to actually see now this is what we have um, in our, this is the topology of our services essentially. And this is the way they interact between each other. So that kind of graph is what you get when you enter the, the, pack, the pack UI. If you click on one of the arrows, then you actually get um, a description of all the interactions that are happening and have been recorded between those two services. And that's great because now we don't even have to document our services anymore. They're self-documented by example with the way other services are using the interactions. And if there is no such thing as documented interaction, well, maybe nobody's using it. Maybe that interaction shouldn't even be there. Um, We've tried for a long time um, using Swagger and tools like this for, genera for generating documentation. Turns out like, it just did this annotation nightmare, just more annotation than code. And if you try to create your own documentation yourself, usually it drifts away and it's not, and it's out of sync. The very cool thing with this now is that we found that whenever there was a new consumer coming along, um, the usual way is go to the broker or go to look at Pact and say, how is another service using this? And then we get a really clear example of this is the type of calls I can make and this is the type of response I can expect. And in their own turn, then, if they start using the service, they'll push their own pact and their interactions will be verified. So all that is very cool. That's kind of a nice side effect. But the really powerful thing in there is all the integrations for, let's say, build and deployment pipeline. So now when we push a pact, we can version the consumer. We can tag the consumer with what environment it's running in. So not only we have the interaction between two services, but we can also know the interactions between this service that's on this environment looks like this. So the provider can verify before pushing a service to a different environment, check all the packs that are, let's say, if we like have multiple regions or something like that, and the provider can go, give me all the services that are running in the Europe region, give me all the packs that exist, and I'm going to be verified before I start upgrading my service because I don't want to be breaking that environment. That's pretty cool because now you can have kind of diff different deployment cycles with UAT environments, um, different regions on live, and that kind of stuff. Um, there's a fair bit of work in getting that, that integration, and it's obviously something to think about. Um, I don't have time to actually talk about all that today, but uh, feel free to catch me after. Um, I have a few more slides on that, but um, it couldn't, it couldn't, it couldn't uh, fit in 30 minutes. So. Um, 
happy to talk about that after. Um, but even, bef even before that integration is done, the simple unit testing phase, you reap like, you reap 80% of, of, the, of the rewards. Now, a caution, really, uh, not really a caution though. Um, that's a really cool side effect that we've seen as part of this. So originally, we investigated contracts because we didn't want to start end-to-end -end environments. We didn't want to have very slow integration tests, and, but we wanted to test our APIs. We wanted to verify, is our API stable? Um, are we not breaking anything? But the cool thing is, we found out that it actually became really central to our way to work. Anytime two teams now come, come along and are going to be interacting on a new API, the first thing they do is get around to a whiteboard, let's work with the pact, let's, let's, say, let's design a pact that we can agree on, and then we can go both on our sides and implement, the, implement that service uh, on our own side with the agreement that the interactions are, are, are great. So now team are actually, teams are actually discussing and collaborating around API designs. And that collaboration is one of the key elements in microservices anyway, that if people don't talk to each other, this is not going to work because the interactions are very important and using a tool like Pact without collaboration is probably not going to work either anyway. Um, if the teams are not decided to agree on things, um, unfortunately that might not be the thing for you. <laughs> so what's the catch? Um, it's it's so, all well and good. Um, we can test our APIs and it looks very quick. quick. We don't have any end-to-end -end, uh, environments. One thing that I mentioned earlier is the, the assumption. So the provider state setup, uh, which was assuming that there's a user called Pierre, then if I get this request, etc. cetera. Um, well, a lot of services are gonna depend on state. So you're gonna have to set up that state earlier. It's, it's a little bit of setup logic. Um, we found it pretty tricky to deal with at the start. Um, and obviously this, there is an agreement and there is more discussion needed between the consumer and the provider for agreeing on a set of defined states that the service can start with. Um, consumer can't come along and say, well, now I have all these different uh, 20 new states I assume you'd be in. Provider might say, well, now I need to actually look at all these states, implement my set, et cetera. So coming with an agreement, coming discussing these things, again, discussion is key. Um, and same thing, if there's a large number of consumers, a large number of interactions, it's still it's a little bit of pressure on the provider. Um, but if there's a large number of consumer on the service, usually that's kind of a red flag anyway. Um, then coverage. So like any types of testing, um, if there's no coverage, there's not going to be any confidence. So coverage is not an indicator of uh, good testing, but lack of coverage is usually an indicator of bad testing. So. You have to be careful that it doesn't become a box ticking exercise of like these two services communicate together. We have a pact in it, but maybe the pact tests like one interaction with just kind of one type of payload. Like everything, we need to, we need to cover more cases. We need to cover all the endpoints. Um, we need to cover what's not the happy path. So exceptions, error codes, that kind of stuff. If we go to the user's example, what, if, um, what happens if I request a user that does not exist? Do I get a 404? Do I get a 400? Do I get a 200 with a message say user doesn't exist? Do I get 200 with an empty object? All these things, like some of them might be wrong, some of them might, might be valid. Recording them in the interaction makes it clear to anybody that this is the way it should be working. Um, and it actually makes it clear that there's a discussion that needs to start with the provider or say, well, what happens if you give me a user that doesn't exist? And they can't change that interaction after the fact. On the other hand as well, Let's try not to be too overzealous. Um, it's probably not the place to test the business logic of the service you're consuming. There we're trying to verify that the endpoint is right, that the payload is right, but maybe we don't really want to go and verify the way the service we're consuming is working. Um, one interesting discussion that we actually had like a couple of weeks ago is on validation, for example. Um, should you be testing the validation rules of the service you're consuming, or should you just be checking what the validation message um, should be when you send something invalid. So um, let's say if we were to create a user, for example, and say that one of the, the logic is a username is limited to 50 characters. That might be open to change, but that's the responsibility of the user service. The pact and interaction probably shouldn't be, um, if I give you a username of 55 characters, then you respond something wrong. The pact should be, if I give you an invalid username, whatever reason that could be, then this is what the response should look like. I should get a 400 with saying, some kind of message um, in there. 
Um, then finally, what I was saying earlier is the automation within the deployment pipeline, that's definitely not trivial. Um, it's going to depend on your workflow. It's going to depend on the different environments. Um, how is your deployment flow and et cetera? Um, happy to talk about that later, but it's usually something that you really need to sit down and think about. Um, so just to finish up, so after using consumer driven contracts now for about two years, um, well, what we found there is like we're a lot more confident when we're coding, as in when we are making changes to a service, that we feel like we have enough safety net not to break other services. And when we're deploying, we're actually, we actually know that what we're deploying is solid because the packs have been passed. Um, the great thing is to be able to break the tests as early as possible if something is broken. Break them in the unit test, break them before committing anything, break them before deploying anything anywhere. Um, it saved us a number of times where maybe we tried to change an API and we forgot that, oh, yeah, that consumer is actually using us and we didn't, we didn't know about it. Um, and the greatest side effect is relying less and less on end-to-end -end environments, not having to prop up an entire system before just deploying the simplest fix to maybe a service that's 200 lines of code. That's a huge benefit. If, we're, if all we're going for is continuous delivery and being fast, um, if we code the changes fast, but it takes an hour to deploy it, an hour to test it, and maybe an hour to retest it because it failed, then we're kind of losing all the benefit for it. It put back API design, API design as the forefront of what we're doing, um, and especially the collaboration. And it's the first thing that we need to think about. It's the important bit that whenever there's an API that needs to be designed, then the two parties come, come together. And it's very consumer driven as well. That now it's no longer the provider that goes and says, look, I'm providing you an API, use it that way. Um, that's my decision, I'm coding the API, you should be using me that way. Now the consumer might come across and say, well, look, if I'm using your API the way you coded it, maybe I'm gonna need to use to call it 20 times to get what I want. Can I get an endpoint that might be a little bit, um, a little bit better? And when we're talking about microservices, the number of interactions, it should be minimal. So a service that designs an API should be designed for designing it for the consumers, for the consumers that are using it. Um, but the, on the other side of, of the equation is now the consumer is responsible for, for creating those contracts. It's the, responsible on, the responsibility is on them to documenting their usage of the way um, those APIs are defined. Um, is there a way to say, please don't break this when you change something? Um, and the great thing is now, the API documentation as part of this is actually be generated. And that's, that's a, very, it's a very cool side effect um, that it just feels like automatically generating pure API spec feels less of a burden now uh, because we actually have a way to, to look at it. So that's it. That's everything I have um, for, for today. Um, try it out. Um, so Pact, Pact Broker, um, they're available on GitHub. It's all free open source. Um, a bit more reading, uh, so the pack, ma pack matrix that touches, to, that's an old enough blog post, but very, very good, that touches on the deployment pipeline piece of how do you test in, against different environments, how do you make sure that the production system is, um, is gonna be fine after deploying your service. Um, and then a few blog posts, so that's from our blog posts on, um, on how we're using the, the consumer driven contracts, so examples of how you would use it um, in, in um, Java, I think, so with the JUnit plugin. And, um, how, like the examples of the different calls and how you would integrate it with a with with pack broker um, right thanks um, everybody um, hopefully that was clear enough I thought there was probably a lot in there to uh, to take in um, so do we have time to take a few questions or okay okay I'll come back after yeah yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned like, testing responses every time so I assume we're talking about like REST APIs, but can you use this for something like RabbitMQ? Um, so with events uh, that might be a bit different, uh, I know the latest version of Pact supports um, supports consumer driven contracts uh, based on events. Um, we haven't used that. Um, we've used different techniques to test uh, to test events with Kafka, um, with kind of schema versioning and Avro and that kind of stuff. Uh, similar idea that again, push as much of that into the unit testing and validation. So, um, but PAC does support, um, has some support on, on events, but I haven't, like, I haven't tried it myself. I just want to know, is, like, how, how do you decide, how do you decide on the size of a microservice? 
Oh, well, that's a, that, that, was, that wasn't a quick one. <laughs> um, it depends. It, it, it's about doing one thing. Um, the, the idea is that if that service should be doing one thing, it's not a matter of lines of code or, or anything. It's because depending on the language, it might be different. Uh, it, usually, it's if it does one thing, it should just be focusing on that one thing. There's a lot of work into just defining the boundaries of things and figuring out. It's, it's a lot about domain modeling. And, and so um, that's kind of the million dollar question, really. <laughs> There's actually a lot of AMPP support. All right. <laughs> uh, just one addition. When you're talking about the consumer driven contracts, do you actually end up more talking about the intersection points between the different microservices and just coming up with a common contract? Or is it always, do you always say what's consuming it? As in if there was multiple consumers of a given yeah. service? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, usually each of the consumers will have their own, their own con contracts. They kind of expressing the way they're using the service. And they might be different. Um, usually, if the services are small, there might be a good bit of intersection between the two. But typically, it's ev every, every consumer can create their pact. And they might be, they might be slightly different. Um, it's, um, I would say they, they, prob they probably do converge, but um, it's it's responsibility of each of them to to actually create their their packs. And if a service get was to get retired, then they just remove their their, their pack, and the other ones are still there. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Question: If you've got multiple consumers, is there any kind of consistency checking between packs because they might be inconsistent? Um, yeah, so that's the risk when if, if there's a lot of consumers, there might be some consumers trying to drag the API one way rather than the other. And it, it, then it's about, it's about the design, it's about the discussions. Um, uh, typically, all the packs should be passing. So um, that means they should all be working with the API that's provided. Um, and if there's a change, then we need that needs to make sure that all the packs are still, are still valid. So if there's a lot of consumers, and there's more and more consumers of given service, that, and they want the service to be doing slight, a lot more and more different things, that's usually an indicator that maybe there should be different services, and maybe that service is kind of a bottleneck for, for a, lot of, a lot of cases. So um, like a lot of things in the microservices spirit is the communication and just getting people to talk to each other about why they're doing things, how they're interacting with each other. Um, Pack doesn't solve it, but it's going to highlight it. It's going to highlight that there's a problem. It's going to highlight that, yeah, OK, this API is used in many different ways. Um, maybe we're doing something kind of strange. Um, uh, you mentioned, I mean, we're interested in that collaboration of the team to design the API. Mm -hmm. But the way you mentioned, it seems that you're writing or using Pack when you are creating blueprints for your API. but. Uh, I tested it and really you generate from the unit test the pack. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, you know really how the team uses pack when you don't have you know you know you don't have anything to do. So well, so when I'm saying the team come together and work on a pack to each other, so like the pack file is a JSON file, so you can handcraft it if you want. So uh, the consumer side of thing, and when everything is implemented, then you would have your unit test generating it and everything. But by handcrafting this at the beginning, it just gives the provider a way to say start running my test against it. And there's necessarily going to be some um, adjustments to that pact as we go on, some, maybe some data fields, or maybe some fields are going to be renamed. But that's that interaction that there's an assumption at the beginning that this, this is the way we name these fields. This is the way that object is structured. And it's kind of a, it's a nice starting point um, that before we probably wouldn't have. Before, it might have been the provider going, yeah, I'm going to write you that API, and then Two weeks later, you have an API documentation saying, well, actually, it doesn't really do what I want. Um, so, and then you have to go back there. Just clearly, we state everything from the start. And the nice thing is you can handcraft that. So, um, all right. Thanks very much. <laughs>